We're here in Brunswick, Maine, in the house that for more than 50 years was home to Joshua Chamberlain. Just like the man himself, the house went through a lot of transformations and witnessed many major historic events during its lifetime. In 1983, the Pajeepscot Historical Society purchased the house, saving it from demolition. And today, the house is operated as a museum, telling the story of Chamberlain, his family, and the building itself. The building now known as the Joshua L. Chamberlain Museum was most likely built by Jesse Pierce sometime in the late 1820s. At this time, the house was a simple two-story cape. The owner, Marianne Fales, rented out three rooms of the building to Bowdoin College professor Henry Wadsworth Longfellow before it was sold in 1836. After a series of owners, another Bowdoin College professor, Joshua L. Chamberlain, started renting the home in 1856. Three years later, Chamberlain purchased the building for $2,100. Here's the main hall of the home. The house wasn't always at this location. It was built at Fort Potter Street and it remained there throughout the Civil War until 1867 when Joshua Chamberlain and his wife Fanny sold a portion of the lot and moved their home to where it is now. After the move, they made several changes to the house's exterior, including adding decorative red Maltese crosses, which were the badge of Chamberlain's Fifth Corps, to the Cape's center chimney. The little white knob on the wall is a thermostat at an angle in which Chamberlain could reach it due to his war wounds. Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain was born on September 8, 1828 in Brewer, Maine, and he was the eldest of five children. Brewer was in Chamberlain's youth, a small farming and shipbuilding community. Lawrence, as his family called him, worked on his family's farm and had some experience teaching school. Chamberlain entered Bowdoin College here in Brunswick in 1848, where he studied the traditional classical curriculum, and he quickly showed particular skill at learning languages. He recalled years later visiting the Stowe family on Federal Street in 1851 and hearing Harriet Beecher Stowe read from chapters she'd just completed of Uncle Tom's Cabin. At First Parish Church, he met Fanny Adams, the adopted daughter of the minister. They were to marry in 1855 after a long courtship. But first, Chamberlain took his degree from Bowdoin in 1852 and returned for three more years to the Bangor Theological Seminary. He turned down the opportunity to become a minister or a missionary, and he accepted a position at Bowdoin teaching rhetoric combining all the elements of what today we call speech, combined with English literature and persuasive writing. When the Civil War erupted in 1861, Chamberlain didn't know much about being a soldier, despite a short stint at a military school in Ellsworth, but he was very aware that his father had commanded troops in the Aristic War of 1839 with Canada, that his grandfather had been locally prominent in the War of 1812, and his great-grandfathers had participated in the Revolutionary War. So it's no surprise that Chamberlain felt a real urge to fight for the Union, but Bowden didn't want to lose him, so they offered him a year's travel with pay in Europe in 1862 to study languages. Rather than do that, though, without consulting Fanny, Chamberlain instead volunteered his military services to Maine's governor. He was soon made lieutenant colonel of the 20th Maine Volunteer Infantry Regiment. Here in another case are Chamberlain's boots, which he wore at the Battle of Gettysburg. When you look closely, you can see the patch placed on a boot where a piece of shrapnel hit it on Little Round Top. 
There is nothing left of his uniform except for the buttons and his shoulder boards, which are also displayed here. This is Chamberlain's original Civil War saddle. At the bottom of the case is a photo of him mounted on his valiant steed Charlemagne, also known as Charlie Maine by the locals. This is Chamberlain's office, including his original inkwell. The big red chair was his original governor's chair. This chair was believed to have been lost, but was actually found being used to throne the prom queen once every year at Bowdoin College. His extraordinary Civil War career is well known today thanks to documentaries like Ken Burns' The Civil War and novels like Michael Scharr's The Killer Angels that was made into the movie Gettysburg with Jeff Daniels portraying Chamberlain. Of course, he's best remembered for the action Little Round Top on the second day of the Battle of Gettysburg when then-Colonel Chamberlain and the 20th Maine held the extreme left flank of the Union line against a fierce rebel attack. What's not as well known about Joshua Chamberlain is the wide breadth of his service during the Civil War. Because from Antietam in 1862 to the Grand Review of the Armies in May of 1865, Chamberlain saw quite a bit of the war in the East, including 24 battles and numerous skirmishes. He was wounded six times, once almost fatally at the Battle of Petersburg, and he had six horses shot from underneath him. Another big event Chamberlain participated in was the surrender of Lee's Army of Northern Virginia at Appomattox, where Grant chose him to receive the formal surrender of weapons and colors on April 12, 1865. Notably, Chamberlain had his men salute the defeated Confederates as they marched by in recognition of their valor and of Grant's wish to encourage the rebel army still in the field to accept the peace. Brevet Major General Chamberlain returned briefly to his academic duties at Bowdoin, but as a popular war hero, he was soon elected to four terms as governor of Maine, helping establish a century of domination of Maine politics by the Republican Party. Chamberlain was never a member of the inner circle of the party, though, and was distrusted by its leading politicians. But in his years as chief executive, he helped establish the new agricultural and technical college at Arono that eventually would grow into the University of Maine. He did his best to attract investment into a state whose economy was beginning to decline and persuaded Scandinavian immigrants to take up farming at New Sweden and elsewhere in Maine. He continued to live here in Brunswick, taking the train to Augusta as state business required. Rather than go into finance or into the railroad business like so many other young Civil War generals, former Governor Chamberlain returned to Bowdoin. Ultimately, he'd spent far more of his life as an educator than as a soldier. In 1871, when his financial situation was at a low point, he was persuaded to accept the presidency of the college. Now, although the Chamberlain's house had already traveled up the street, the greatest challenge to the house would come around this time in 1871. Upon his appointment as Bowdoin College's president, Chamberlain decided not to move into the president's house on campus. Rather, he elected to stay in his own home, which stood just across the street from the college. He raised it 11 feet into the air and constructed a new first floor built underneath it. The new first floor was much more spacious and fashionable than the classic cape had been and provided much more room for Chamberlain to entertain students, professors, and other guests. Remembering the engineering skills of West Point trained officers and trying to adjust to a new age, 
Chamberlain reshaped the curriculum to include modern scientific and engineering topics. Even though that was a short-lived experiment at Bowden, it did produce at least one very famous alumnus, the polar explorer, Admiral Robert Peary, who was in the class of 1877. In 1893, Congress finally gave him the Medal of Honor for his gallantry at Gettysburg. Whenever he could, he enjoyed sailing at his summer retreat, Domhegan, on Simpsons Point, not far from here. In 1905, Fanny Chamberlain died. And five years prior to Fanny's death, Chamberlain was appointed surveyor of the Port of Portland, where he lived until his death in 1914 at the age of 85. Although never forgotten in Maine, Chamberlain largely faded from national view for most of the 20th century. No statue of him was ever erected at Gettysburg and not many historians studied his campaigns. But with the surge of interest in the Civil War in the 1990s, he reemerged as really an exemplary figure among the Union generals, the model of the proverbial citizen soldier. He was quite literally a warrior poet diplomat. So if you've been to Little Round Top on the Gettysburg battlefield, this is a great place to continue reflecting on Joshua Chamberlain, his life, his service, his sacrifices, and all the lessons he instilled along the way. And then, once you've visited his home, you can visit his final resting place at Pine Grove Cemetery, just down the road, also here in Brunswick.